There has been a water mill on this site since before 974. The mill is mentioned in the Doomsday Book when it was valued at a pound sterling. The present mill was rebuilt following a fire in 1754. At one time it had three water wheels and ten millstones. There are two cantilevered gable housings, lucums, fitted with grain hoists, one over the water for barges and the other on land for carts. Owners of all grain milled paid two tolls, one to Ramsey Abbey until its destruction by Henry VIII and one to the miller in processing fees. The mill then became a crown property until it was sold into private ownership in 1625. Most of the flour was sent by barge along the River Great Ouse to the port of Kings Lynn and then shipped into London via the Thames River. This water wheel was enclosed a long time ago, a practical move. Current access is limited to the ground in first floors where we can see the old wooden construction, a storage area and old wood gears. This model shows what the first mill may have looked like. Can you spot the item that is out of place for the 10th century? Here it is. The child is playing with an airplane. More gears and robust trusses. The artisans knew the details in their heads and could build to withstand the stresses and vibrations. This axle standing two stories high is made from an elm trunk. This wood had the fewest knots and could withstand the rotational forces. The gear disc is of hornbeam, a hard dense wood likely to last a long time. The teeth are of apple or pear wood. These woods are relatively brittle and should there be a problem with the machinery the apple cogs will shear and disconnect the drive before anything more expensive gets damaged. The speaking pipe. A whistle blown meant go to the pipe, uncork it and listen for instructions from the miller. More gears and machinery connected to one of the 10 millstones fitted in this mill. This one was turned by the remaining water wheel. The grain was moved along the top floor by Archimedean screws to be gravity fed to the millstones. An open lower stone to show the intricate pattern that had to be maintained together with the pattern on the upper stone. We see a dressing hammer and a marking out template. A careful miller would only need to have his stone dressed by a mason every 10 days or so. Machinery is a relatively new development. This is a quern stone as used in ancient Britain. The hand stone was moved in a back and forward motion across the saddle quern, while this is a hand operated rotary quern. A view of a few more of the 10 millstones in this mill. Only one is now operational and it is electrically driven. Imagine this gear rumbling all day at about 125 revs a minute with fresh grain flowing down the feeder. The millstones are fed through the top center with the milling action and pattern on the stones causing the flour to move to the outer edge and cascade off the stone to be caught below. A mixture of iron and wood axles and gears as time progressed and wooden axles needed replacement, it made sense to purchase items made of iron. A beautifully handmade bevel gear with the axle on the right leading to where there used to be a water wheel installed. Gears and axles connected to the second removed water wheel. The tentering gear which gives rise to the expression being on tenter hooks. This is the structure that holds the upper millstone off the lower and allows adjustment, which can be as fine as half a millimeter or two hundredths of an inch. Modern iron bevel gears on the remaining operating millstones driven by electricities. On the ground floor the miller's speaking pipe with a power governor in the background. The sack settler. The village lad would lift and drop the sacks to settle the flour so more could be added. There is a small balcony which allows the miller to take a break from the noise and dust of milling. I spotted this wagtail enjoying life. We are back outside. The ducks are saying, peoples means food. Sorry to have disappointed you guys. Two of the three water wheels were on the outside of this wall of the building. They were removed in 1930 when the mill closed and sluice gates were installed to control water flows. 
From the downstream point, one gets an ideal view of the old mill. Take the time to join us as we walk past the mill into the village of Houghton. We pass a picturesque thatch cottage in Waterclose on our way to visit St. Mary's Church. The oldest part of this church dates from the 13th century. from inside to outside, walking down the length of the churchyard. then through the graveyard to see more of the old cottages which make up this part of the village of Houghton and Whiten. Some get a little distorted to put them in the film. I've only had my 360 camera a couple of days. On the left, a very old half-timbered building with a more modern addition to the right. The COVID shutdown created many book swap sites, like this one in the disused red telephone box. Potto Brown remembered, a second generation miller taking charge of the mill in 1821 when he was 24. He is remembered for his philanthropy. a spin around the town square. Before we find this lovely butter brick building, Then an old timber framed thatched roof barn. Another charming cottage. And a house up for sale. Looks like it needs quite a bit of renovation to the outdoor plaster. Our lunchtime target comes into view. The three jolly butchers, and I can't find a reference to the name, but the building goes back to 1622. Settling into the window seat, ready for fish and chips for lunch. We shared a plate, and it was still too much for us. The pub has four house beers and features two visiting beers. We try the Doom Bar, made in Cornwall and named for the infamous Doom Bar sandbar off the coast, which has accounted for over 600 recorded beachings, capsizes and wrecks. Every thatcher has his own signature that he adds to a roof he creates. These fighting hares are a delightful sight.
Coming through the churchyard, we find near the church door the gravestone of Thomas Garner, a former village blacksmith. It carries an amusing epitaph. My sledge and hammers lie declined, my bellows too have lost their wind. My fire's extinct, my forge decayed, my vice is in the dust all laid. My coal is spent, my iron none, my nails are drove, my work is done. My tired dry corpse here lies at rest, my soul, smoke-like, soars to be blessed. Passing the mill house for a final time. The National Trust run the mill now and their guardian gets to live in the mill house. Farewell to the mill at Houghton, steeped in history. There is so much history around here that we are planning a caravan visit in the near future.